one empty chair. Would anybody from the audience like to come up? <laughs> Actually, we are so fortunate to have the host of the NPR Weekend Edition to conduct this conversation, Scott Simon. <laughs> There's a monitor backstage. Um, it's still 5 nothing Cubs, but um, Cleveland hit a double. No no-hitter anymore, but still 5 nothing Cubs. And you said to me, tough time to show you how inning. prescient Scott Turow is, you said to me, Arietta's problem has always been in the sixth inning. Right. That's the kind of man you honor with this award tonight. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. It's always wonderful for my, uh, for my wife and I to be back home, and thank you, uh, thank you for inviting us. And it's a particular pleasure to be um, with these two magnificent authors. Um, and thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. I'm going to ask you questions in turn. Eric, you live in New York. Why don't you write about your own damn city? <laughs> Well, first of all, I've only lived there for two years. Second, actually, I make it a practice of not writing where I live. Yeah. I, like, I like the adventure of wholly new ideas. And so when I, when I spent a lot of time in Chicago for Devil in the White City, a lot of people think I lived in Chicago during that time. I did not. Um, it was just such an adventure. You know, it's just, that's, that's why I do what I do. It's, it's really great to explore new things. Yeah. And Scott, you have created this place called Kindle County, which those of us who uh, love Chicago see a lot of similarities between Kindle County and Chicago. But why is it not Chicago? Why do you put that other moniker on it? This is really simple. Um, when I started writing Presumed Innocent, which was an eight-year enterprise, about half, half of it composed on the morning commuter train, I thought I was writing about Boston. And I'm not a diary keeper, so the stuff that stimulates me every day, I work into my fiction. So after eight years, the city that I had meant to be Boston now looked a great deal like Chicago, only a little bit smaller. And so I had to give it a, you know, a different name. Mm. Does it keep the kind of distance between you and the city you're writing about that Eric talked about he likes to keep when he's writing nonfiction? I, you know, I do think it's, um, it's better not to have to remember whether Adams runs east or west as you're writing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Does any, anyone know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 runs, it runs west. But um, I, I have a terrible sense of direction, but the Willis Tower, where I've worked for 30 years, happens to be on the corner yeah. of Adams and Wacker. Um, as I was thumbing through each of your books, um, it occurred to me each of you have written a lot about heroism, character, and you've written a lot about evil. I wonder what you've decided after these years of writing about the nature of, of evil in human beings. Scott, you go first. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> um, the, the novel that I've been working on, which will be published next May, is about um, a war crimes investigation at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. And The Hague only, the ICC only prosecutes mon monstrous acts. And um, the, the Bosnian War, about which Scott himself has written beautifully, uh, is at the center of this. And there's no easy way to talk about what happened in Bosnia and the, the, the level of, of evil um, that was brought to bear on civilian populations. Um, you know, e there's a passage there where the two characters debate whether or not um, you can blame the environment and what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. and uh, the investigator tells a long story about a horrible act, and uh, the, the narrator says, you know, when I was a prosecutor, I ended up prosecuting one of my friends for bribery, and he was involved as a plumbing inspector. And, and the other guy says, tells this horrible story and, and says to him, 
I want to be able to say that um, it's, it's not all situational, that, that if it's bad enough, good people say no, because I'd like to think that I would say no. Um, and that's a constant debate throughout the novel. So, um, and I guess it's a debate within myself whether I know what the right answer is, mm -hmm. you know, that we should expect, you know, evil will triumph unless good people stand up. But um, it is part of human nature um, not to. And that's a sad thing. Yeah. Eric, you've, um, you've written about this not only in, in terms of terrible grisly murders that were committed uh, in this very city uh, on the south side, but obviously the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, I wonder what reflections you have about this. You know, what I've come to feel is that <clears throat> you know, evil, famously in terms of what Hannah, Hannah Arendt said, evil can be very, very much banal, mm -hmm. but also very charismatic, as in the case of one particularly famous sociopath, not currently in the election, but uh, <laughs> uh, a guy. however, a guy who, by the way, used similar techniques. I'm inclined to say not yet. But, uh, <laughs> a guy who, who used similar uh, techniques, actually, in terms of employing people and then firing them. But, but you know, that, that aside, what I have found is that it can be very, very much, evil can be very much a banal thing, if it mm -hmm. may be a a submarine commander who is just doing his job who happens to kill 1,200 people, as in the case of my last book, or very charismatic in a sociopathic way in the case of the, the killer Holmes in Devil in the White City, who was a true sociopath, and what that means is he would just as soon kill you as, as take you out for drinks. So it, it just covers the entire gamut. Scott, you're not one of these uh, attorneys who become a writer. You're a writer who became an attorney and then True. began to write again. Was there something in the study of law or being a prosecutor that made you decide, I want to, yeah? I mean, I, when I went to law school, I went to law school after being a creative writing fellow at Stanford and then teaching there on the steerage level of the faculty. And I, when I went to law school, I went expecting to try to continue to write. But uh, I went to law school because I was fascinated by the law. Uh, friends were lawyers, and um, I just, I was much more interested in that than, you know, than criticism. Uh, and I took my own measure well. And the fascination that I felt continued, uh, continues to this day, and it, it has ended up powering the writing. I remember a number of years ago, I think I told you this, I, I was, uh, I was in a gym here and I was in a sauna and I met a man who was convinced he was a character in one of your books. He could have been right, and, you know. Well, <laughs> I think I'd, we exchanged. In any event, uh, there are people all over the city that think that you've got them. And I wonder, is that true in any case or is every character an amalgam? Almost every character is an amalgam. Um, some characters are too are, are too wonderful to pass up. Uh, Bernie Einstein was, uh, you know, a, uh, a Democratic committeeman and mm -hmm. Lord knows what else. Um, and it, it, having met Bernie because I committed what the federal judge on the case regarded the act of terrible judgment of giving uh, Bernie immunity so he would testify against a judge whom he bribed, um, uh, but having spent long hours with him, you, he was, maybe evil is charismatic, but uh, he was such a charming rogue that yeah. uh, I, I couldn't avoid um, letting a lot of Bernie seep into a character in the next book I wrote. Er er Eric, um, you write these magnificent histories about... What was that word you used? Uh, histories? Magnificent. No, magnificent, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, about periods and situations that we kind of thought that we knew. Where do you find all this stuff? Oh, gosh, I asked my wife. She's currently suffering through my, my current search for my next project and, and just actually gave me a plaque that said, keep calm and write a book. It's different with, with each book. Um, 
it's always uh, a complex process of coming up with ideas, challenging them, self-doubt. I often say that the, sort of my motto is what uh, Jimmy Buffett once wrote in one of his songs, which is, indecision may or may not be my problem, you know? And so <laughs> I, 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 just, I just sort of zig and zag until finally, finally I wear myself down. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do this book. Yeah. And then that's what I commit myself to. And, and I hope that in the course of that, I will find things. One, one thing I love is when people come to me and say, you know, I didn't know that. That's my favorite thing. And, and one of these uh, Paris Review writer interview questions, but I, I want to put a little bit of a, a different twist into it. Uh, why do you think you write? And is your answer different now than it would have been 30 years mm. ago? I, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really great question. I mean, at this point, I do it because I love to tell a great story. I love wallowing in, in old archives and so forth and then trying to pull out those little details. I mean, it's very satis satisfying for me, but that's not the way, I mean, once upon a time, I, I mean, I, I was interested in writing since I was 13. I wrote a, wrote a novel when I was 13, it was 75 pages. Um, it was very derivative of Nancy Drew. It had a, um, I was 13, it had a sex scene. You know, and uh, I oh knew nothing God. about sex. Yeah. Um, my wife would argue, I, I still don't. But you know, it's like, it's like it, it's, it, it has changed completely. Then I was just sort of wanted to be a writer, right? And now I just want to write. I love it. I love, I love being able to just sort of dwell in the past and recreate these moments as traumatic as they may be. But it's, for me, it's great fun. May, may I ask, what was the novel about when you were 13? It was about, like I said, the derivative of Nancy Drew, it was about a, a mysterious clock and a clockmaker. The rest of it, I have no clue. I mean, I don't have it anymore. I'd like to find it, but yeah. And, and has this been optioned by Scorsese? <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom Hanks. No, no, no. Okay, Scott, what about you? Um, <clears throat> my mother wanted to be a novelist, and um, I love my mom. My parents, my dad was a doctor, like all you know, Jewish parents of that era, they wanted me to be a doctor. And uh, I, I, the reasons were complex. I didn't get along with my dad. Um, I didn't have a gift in the sciences. Um, and I loved my mom. And uh, so by the time I was 13 or 14 years old, I had announced I'm gonna be um, a novelist. I repeated, you know, Eric's experience uh, almost verbatim. I plagiarized something else that I'd read. And I didn't say plagiarized. Derivative. Yeah. Well, I, I my, mine was, it, it was not plagiarism in the sense it was word for word, but the plot <coughs> bore a strong resemblance to a story that I had read in class when, if this was in seventh grade. Um, and I have to say that for a long time I asked myself, um, are you a writer or somebody who said he wants to be a writer? And I still don't know um, the, the answer about what drove me to go through that struggle to connect thought and feeling with words. But um, when I finally learned to do it, uh, as every writer at every one of these tables can tell you, there is such profound pleasure in it, um, that at that point I knew what I was. And uh, it draws me back every day. Um, <clears throat> you were president of the Authors Guild. I was. And um, I, my memory of that is they really wanted you to be president of the Authors Guild. I mean, you're, you were the Authors Guild Theo Epstein. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'm not sure the results were Homie the same. Example. But uh, is, um, do you worry about a life spent in literature, writing, I don't even want to say in literature, a life spent writing, sharing ideas, is becoming more difficult in these times when there's so much free stuff available? There is no question that, um, the, that authors' lunches are being eaten by a number of people other than authors. There's tremendous concentration in um, the publishing industry, which means there is a smaller market. Um, there is um, 
the what I think is uh, the nefarious effects of Amazon, uh, and Amazon is trying to clear the field of anybody who stands between the reader and them, uh, and they appear to be exceed, succeeding, and the, their next targets, once they've got gotten rid of everybody else, will be the authors. Um, there is, as you point out, tremendous competition from free material on the internet. Uh, somehow people think, um, like my friends at the Huffington Post, that it's appropriate for Ariana to make whatever it was, a billion dollars, but the people who write for her to make nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, then there's Google that believes that it's okay for it to copy uh, little chunks of everybody's book and pay the authors nothing. So uh, the writing life and the survival of the writing life um, is, um, is, it's not in question. There will always be authors. People will always write. Um, but the number of people who are, will be able to make a career um, is bound to be smaller. And as a result of that, the cultural conversation um, that authors and writers inspire um, is, is going to be less rich than it is now. Mm -hmm. And if there's, if there's one or two things you could change to try and make that more possible? Anything well, if I, could, if I could change it, I would make everybody appreciate the fact that, um, that free writing comes at the cost of a diverse literary culture. Eric, what are your, your thoughts about the fact? Is it going to be more difficult for the, for the writing life to survive? It already is. Um, and, I, and I think that there is this very strange delusion uh, out there among writers. Um, I, uh, periodically, I, I, I'm quite active in Twitter, and I'll get these, these, uh, these very excited, superheated tweets from some writers saying, hey, today is my, my uh, on Amazon, my book is being offered free. And I'm like, really? What, what, what does this do for you? What does this do for anybody? You know? and, and the problem does come down to people who are too willing to give their, their things away. Now, it's always kind of been that way. You know, back when people were, you know, when I was coming up as a, as, as a, as a writer of, of, of journalism, magazine pieces, and so forth, I mean, there was always this cadre of people who would write freelance pieces for like no money. They would take like next to nothing because they really wanted to get published, but were you know, really sort of cutting into the opportunity for everybody, including them, in the future. So I do worry a lot about that, and I don't really know what the solution is. For a time, there were those who were exponents of self-publishing, and those who were first into the business, into the business of self-publishing, some of them did actually very well and stood out as models mm -hmm. for those who followed. That's over, that's over, and that's sort of, that's a scary part of it too, is you're sort of lured into that and now it's, it's not there anymore. I don't know what the solution is. There will always be storytellers. There will always be those who want to have their, their who will always want to read those stories. In some ways, I think the next great horizon for writers is, is television, you know? So many exciting things now in television. This is the heyday of really great television. So maybe that's what writers want. But that is find. not the same yeah. And I write. It's not the same. It's I not write the same. for TV, and I'm gonna next week. I'm gonna start on a script, but um, it's it is not the same one-to-one -one communication between author and reader. The that, interior that, that takes place with a book. And it's not. But if you're talking about making a living, that may be where people will have to go. Well, thanks very much for being with us, both of you, in your work and your life. Honor this city and honor the name of Sam. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much.